don't recall if I turned that on. I don't think I did. It's turned on. Okay, very good. Well, first and foremost, I want to express my deepest appreciation for these last few days that we have had the opportunity to be together, to study a portion of God's Word, and to be able to sing together, to pray together, to be able to uh, remember the Lord's death last first day of the week. And uh, it's been a privilege to me. I really enjoyed not only the company of each and every one of you, uh, also the hospitality of you. I really appreciate everything you have done for me, uh, far more than what I deserve. But I really, once again, want to express my appreciation for the invitation, uh, since, uh, like I said, nobody really knows me. And so the only connection here was through Brendan. And I really appreciate uh, you having uh, taken his confidence in my ability to be able to uh, come and be with you over the last several days. And so I really hope that our time together has been in one way or another encouraging. And uh, as we end this uh, meeting, as we end it tonight, uh, like I said, about the only lessons in which there was any continuity to them uh, was the one from last night and the one for today. Uh, yesterday, if you had the opportunity to be with us, we were talking about the power behind the tongue, but specifically we were looking at the destructive power that it can have. And we were going through the arguments that James in chapter 3 actually makes. They're very incredible arguments there to show how much the tongue can have power to uh, uh, influence, whether for good or bad. Uh, also, how it can control our own uh, life uh, because of the way that we use that, especially if we're using it for wrong. Uh, we talked about how also uh, it is very destructive. That is described as having the power of fire, flames, and it's set on fire by hell, it says there. And so, and we also talked about the last point there that James makes is how a man has a capability to control all manner of wild beasts, but the tongue is uncontrollable. And so uh, it's not impossible, but it is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and because of that, I wanted to follow that uh, thought of that lesson yesterday, uh, looking at another area in which uh, I think we can use very uh, effectively uh, that tongue. We can use it for the purpose of building up. The constructive power of the tongue is what we want to consider in our lesson this evening, uh, which is the opposite of what we were talking about uh, yesterday. I will like to do, however, is uh, first and foremost, uh, have you keep this in mind before we go any further, that the kinds of words that we're going to be studying tonight, they have no cost. When we think about constructing something, when we think about construction, uh, especially in the last couple of years, uh, material has gotten really expensive. Uh, not too long ago, I did some repairs on our home, uh, and so I had to rebuild a, uh, a porch that we had made out of wood, and just the lumber prices was just so expensive to be able to purchase all the necessary uh, wood and, and, and everything else needed to repair that porch, and so it's really expensive. And so if you've done anything around your house, for example, and bought material, it can get very, very expensive really quick. However, the material that we're going to be studying tonight, that is the material that we're to use to build up, to construct, it has no cost. However, it can accomplish a lot. And so I want you to keep this in mind as we consider what we talked about yesterday, how easily we can destroy with our words, but how also we can edify, we can build up, we can construct and fortify through our words as well. And so we're going to look at six specific types of words that can definitely make a huge difference in the life of others in our own life to, uh, our itself uh, if we're willing to make the effort in utilizing these and utilizing them on a consistent basis. And so, uh, like I said, we're going to look at six types of words that can build up and edify any relationship, whether that relationship is at work, for example, if you are uh, going to a uh, type of job that's a nine to five type of, uh, of job, office construction, whatever it is, if you use these kinds of words, you're going to see that you're going to be more effective at work, especially, for example, those of you who are in positions of leadership, whether you are in management or whatever it is that you do, and others are actually, uh, you are uh, above others, you are, others are uh, uh, following your leadership. If you use these kinds of words in that uh, relationship at work, it's going to allow you to become a better leader. Maybe that relationship is, for example, at home as a uh, spouse, as a husband, or as a child, or, or as a brother or sister, it's going to allow you also to build up that relationship at home. Uh, or even in the church, you know, as we were talking about yesterday, some churches suffer because of uncontrolled uh, tongues, because sometimes brethren do not know how to refrain themselves from certain things and only cause division in the church. 
Well, the words that we're going to talk about today, the kinds of words that we're going to be discussing in our lesson, if we use these and implement them and uh, consistently uh, are uh, using these kinds of words, it's going to help also the church. It's going to build it up. It's going to fortify it. And so uh, there are six specific kinds that I want to discuss in our lesson this evening. I hope and uh, pray that you will find our lesson encouraging uh, and helpful. And so the first kind of uh, words that I think is probably the very fundamental ones. Uh, if we are considering, once again, the idea of a construction, uh, when you build a new building, usually the very first thing you have to do is the foundation, lay the foundation. And I think that these kinds of words definitely are the foundation upon which we can build everything else and make a very strong, very uh, uh, effective uh, uh, you know, relationship if we are willing to build upon words that are kind. Uh, like we said yesterday, the book of Proverbs is just filled with passage after passage to show how words can definitely be very, very useful uh, if we use them for good. And when it comes to kind words, I want you to notice what the wisdom writer says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 24. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 24, the wisdom writer says this, pleasant words, he says, are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Now, I'm a diabetic, and I've been a diabetic for over 20 years, and I really shouldn't be eating candy, but every now and then I get craving for a piece of candy, and, you know, I'll get a candy bar, and, and, and I always think, I'm just going to take a bite, and next thing you know, I ate the whole thing, and so I really shouldn't be doing that, but sometimes, you know, I just want a little piece, and I end up eating the whole thing. Well, why? Because it's good. It, it's something that we enjoy. And so here the wisdom writer compares pleasant words as a honeycomb. And we know that honey is a very, uh, one of those uh, perfect foods. They call it a, uh, a, a superfood because it contains all kinds of nutrients. And obviously it's delicious. People like it. And, and so it mentions here how pleasant words are like a honeycomb. But if you notice the last part, it says sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Uh, the New Living Translation, I don't think it's a really good translation, it's a paraphrase, but I like the way it translates that last part in the New Living Translation. It says there in verse 24, sweet to the soul, and it says, and healthy for the body. He's comparing here, pleasant words are sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. An individual who is careful in how he uh, uses his words to edify others, it's going to benefit him. And we talked about yesterday how sometimes when we do not use our words for edifying, we use it to destroy, it's like stabbing, like someone with a sword and just stabbing someone else. That's how words can be uh, to other people. However, for an individual who uses pleasant or kind words, what's going to happen is not only sweetness to his soul, but also it's healthy for the body. And so this is why, again, I think that if there is a foundation that we should use to build up our character, to build up our relationship when it comes to the way we express ourselves, kindness. Kindness is absolutely uh, one of those things that is absolutely important. By the way, you may not remember tomorrow the kind words that you express to someone today. However, the person who receives them, most of the time what's going to happen is they will never forget those words. You may forget about it tomorrow, but the person who is the recipient of kindness, of kind words, most of the time, they will not forget those things. Chapter 15 of the same book of Proverbs. But look at verse number 26. Chapter 15, verse 26, the wisdom writer says, Evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant words are pure. Pleasant words, they are pure. And so, uh, without a doubt, a person who is kind in the way that he expresses himself, a person who uses his words carefully to build rather than to destroy, they are, as it's mentioned here at the end of verse 26, they are pure. Everybody would love that. Everybody would enjoy that when a person is that way in the way he expresses himself with kindness. Same chapter, but verse 23, the wisdom writer says this, a man has joy in an apt answer, and how delightful is a timely word. If you've ever been uh, talking to someone and you mention something and they say, you know what, I really needed to hear that. That really made my day. Well, the wisdom writer says here at the end of verse 23, how delightful is a timely word. Now, I grant that it is a learned behavior. It's something that we need to train ourselves to consistently use in our daily speech. And sometimes, you know, you will make somebody's day 
Like I said, you may not remember the kind words that you express to someone today, but most likely those persons who receive it probably will never forget it, especially if they were having a bad day, they were having a, a, you know, a, a situation where they just felt discouraged and all of a sudden you say something uh, that helps them, they don't forget, that, forget it that easy. Uh, same book of Proverbs, but chapter 10, and in verse 21, the wisdom writer says there in chapter 10 and in verse 21, he says this, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of understanding. The lips of the righteous feed many. Now again, the New Living Translation, it's not uh, the kind of translation that I would recommend to use as a primary uh, reading Bible. Uh, if you want to use it kind of a, as a commentary, I think it does help because oftentimes it would word certain things in such a way that you can see what the point is being made. But in the New Living Translation, the first part of that verse says, the words of the godly encourage many. The words of the godly encourage many. The lips of the righteous, and the New American Standard says, feed many. And the New Living Translation says, the words of the godly encourage many. And so definitely, if we are to be people that are known as those who encourage, who build rather than destroy, we need to start by using kind words, learning how to say things, learning how to express certain things. Uh, often, oftentimes, again, we have to be careful because sometimes we think, well, I, I just like to be very frank, and sometimes we confuse frankness with being rude. Uh, a good friend of mine, now he's passed away now, but he was a really good guy, uh, preached for many, many years, preached for about 60 years, and so uh, he was a good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he didn't have a tactful way of saying things. And uh, I told him one time, I said, brother, you got to be very careful. I mean, that, that really sounds terrible. And, and he says, well, I'm just very frank. And, and yeah, he, you know, unfortunately, the, the uh, boldness and the frankness that he had uh, was so that it didn't seem like he had a filter. And I told him, I said, yeah, I understand that. I, I, I appreciate that you are always honest, but sometimes we confuse frankness with rudeness, and sometimes we come across as rude. And so we have to be careful, especially in the case of those of us who teach and preach the gospel. Uh, you know, we have to be really careful in how we express ourselves because the words of the godly can encourage many, as the New Living Translation says there. Uh, chapter 19, same book of Proverbs, but verse 22. Chapter 19 and in verse number 22. Once again, the wisdom writer says this in verse 22. What is desirable in a man is his kindness... And it is better to be a poor man than a liar. Now, I want you to notice that first part of that verse. What is desirable in a man is his kindness. Now, not many people use the American Standard Version of 1901, but I like the way it's translated there. Uh, it, by the way, if you ever want to look for a translation that is probably most accurate into the English language from the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, there is no doubt that the American Standard of 1901 is probably the most accurate translation from the Hebrew and the Greek into the English language. But in that translation, it words it this way, the first part of verse 22, that which make it a man to be desired is his kindness. A person who is kind in the way that he expresses himself is a person who is attractive, not physically necessarily, I'm not talking about a physical attraction, but you know, a person who is always kind, people love to be around that kind of people. People love to be around people who are encouraging, who are positive, who are always looking for the best interest in others and are always expressing it. And so uh, the wisdom writer says there, that which make it a man to be desired is his kindness. And so absolutely, I think that the very foundation of having a strong relationship, whether it is at work, whether it is at home or in the church, is to begin by using words that will encourage others and being, uh, using words that are kind to others. Uh, here's a good example. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 10. Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam becomes the king. Now, for what we can see there in the, the, that chapter, chapter 10, it doesn't seem that Rehoboam knew very much what to do as now the king. And, and so the people come over to him, and they're saying, you know what, your father Solomon, yes, he did a lot of impressive work, did a lot of building and all that, but we're tired of all these taxes. Just give us a little bit of breather. And so what Rehoboam does is he goes and talks to the elders, those who were uh, serving under Solomon, those men who were uh, highly trained. And so he goes to them 
and he asked their advice. What shall I do? And notice what they said to him in verses 6 to verse number 7 of 2 Chronicles chapter 10. This is the advice that the older men that helped Solomon during his rule, it's, this is the advice they gave to Rehoboam, verse number 6 and verse number 7. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you counsel me to answer this people? They spoke to him, saying, If you be kind to the people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. Notice the counsel that these men gave Rehoboam. If you would just be kind to them and speak good words to them, the outcome is they will be your servants forever. You know, uh, before I got into full-time preaching, uh, I used to work for a company and I was managing a warehouse uh, that they had in, in, in the state of Oregon. And uh, I was in charge of a, a few employees. It wasn't a very large warehouse, but we uh, did have a few employees there and I was in charge. And so I've been in positions of management before. When I was in California, I worked for another company and I was in charge of production there. And so uh, it, uh, I know what it's like to be in a position where you have others working under you. And I know uh, for a fact that when a person who is in charge, someone who's in management, is good to the employees, understands sometimes things happen and, 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 and he treats them well, he speaks to them well, the employees react by also working well for that company. They work well uh, in whatever area that they're doing. But when a manager is uh, harsh, a person who's in charge is not good with the employees, they may tolerate him because they have a job, but that doesn't mean they follow their leadership. And so what I want to get with all of this is when we use our words kindly to encourage others, you know, that is what's going to inspire others to follow you. Don't be one who is tolerated, whatever the reason might be, whether it is because, well, you know, uh, at home, maybe your spouse, they tolerate you, but they really don't feel inspired by you. Change, and you will see that people will follow your lead. That's what the elders told Rehoboam. If you would do this, they will be your servants forever. But if you recall in your Bible studies, he doesn't listen to them. He goes to his friends, perhaps those who had grown up in a privileged life where they never had to be in any position of, uh, of leadership. And, and so he goes and talks to them. What should I do? And their counsel was, well, your father had them wrapped around his hand. You have to have them wrapped around your finger. And so he listens to them. And what happened? The country splits. The 10 northern tribes says, you know what? We're not doing this. We're separating. They get their own king, uh, Jeroboam. It didn't work out well for them as well. Jeroboam, un unfortunately, although there was a lot of, uh, what I would say, there was a lot of hope there for, uh, for Jeroboam. And the Lord had told him, if you would just follow me, your kingdom will be established. But unfortunately, he built that calf there in Bethel and one in Dan. And you recall there, the people would go as far as the northern part of the tribes there to Dan to worship the calf. And after that, it was all downhill for the northern tribes. But the point that I want you to see is Rehoboam, could have had the opportunity to be the kind of leader that the people needed. And if he would have listened to the elders, just be kind to them, speak good words to them, and they will be your servants forever. Well, he didn't listen, and that was the outcome. How powerful can words be? Look at what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 18. In the context, I grant that Paul is addressing here the question of the resurrection and, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what it's going to be like and so on. And I want you to notice the Apostle Paul mentions there in verse number 18, uh, there are some who apparently are worried that they died, uh, you know, Christians that died, and the Lord hadn't returned, and they missed the return of the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul says no. As a matter of fact, he goes on and explains when the Lord returns, they're not going to miss it because they're going to resurrect first, and then we're going to all unite and be with the Lord forever. And then he says in verse 18 this, verse number 18, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Words can be comforting. Words can be encouraging. Words can be very effective in building up. Just like we saw yesterday, words can be very effective and, and highly destructive. Uh, so also can words be very effective in encouraging and comforting one another. And that's why Paul says, now that you know that they're not going to miss the coming of the Lord because they're going to resurrect first, and then we will be united with them and meet the Lord in the air. He says in verse 18, comfort one another with these words. 
if I would have my pick and say, what would I put down as a foundation to build up a good relationship, whether it is at work, the church, at home, kind words, I would say, would be the very foundation of that good, strong uh, building, uh, you know, like I said, whether it is at work, whether it is at the church, or at home. But very closely related to that, I would put in second place the idea of being grateful and using gratitude, being grateful all the time. This is one of the key uh, messages of the gospel. A person who has been the recipient of some form of blessing, some form of kindness, should in turn reflect that by being a grateful person. There is a great example in the book of Luke chapter 17, where the Lord encounters a group of lepers. And uh, the Bible uh, tells us under the Old Testament law, now, when a person had leprosy, uh, they were supposed to be away from everyone else. It's a contagious uh, disease, a terrible disease, and it's a skin problem. And so uh, what they would have to do is they have to be away from everyone else. And if anyone would come near them, they had to yell out leper so that they would uh, know and not get anywhere near. Well, there's a group of lepers that are hanging out together because nobody else would be with them. And so there's a group of 10 and Jesus encounters them, and I want you to notice what happens here in verses 11 through verse number 19 of Luke 17. It says this, while they, he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And he entered a village, uh, as he entered a village, ten leprous men stood at a distance and met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, masters, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. As they were going, they were cleansed. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell in, on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Verse 19, And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. And I want you to notice verse 16. At the end of verse 16, there's an interesting note there about this individual that comes back. And it says here, he was a Samaritan. Now, to us, it doesn't seem like a big deal, okay? Well, it just mentions, you know, he was not Jewish. He was a Samaritan. Why would the scripture do that? Why would it mention the fact that he's a Samaritan? Samaritans were despised by the Jews. Uh, Samaritans, these are the individuals who after the kingdom of Assyria, after the Assyrian Empire took the northern tribes into captivity, one of the things that they would do is they would take everyone who could be useful to the empire. So if you were a, a smith or, or you had some trade, well, they would take you so that you can use that for the benefit of the empire. But people that they considered was just too expensive to move, elderly people, people that were too young, people that had some kind of a uh, physical problem, they would leave them behind. They, didn't, they were not going to move them. They would only take those whom they considered could be useful to the empire. But in an effort to prevent anyone from getting a little bit uh, of that patriotic feeling and try to uh, regain control of their land, what they would do is they would move people from other countries to these lands so that they would still be able to function, they would farm and everything, but nobody's going to defend the land that didn't belong to them. And so the Assyrians and the Babylonians would do the same thing. And so when they bring back a lot of these people, a lot of these heathen nations into the uh, northern tribes to what was uh, the kingdom of Israel, the few Jews that remain there begin to intermarry some of these people. And so those who were born out of that relationship were half Jew, were half Gentile. When the Jews of the southern tribes, after they are taken into captivity, and they come back. If you remember in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, as they're rebuilding, uh, Sambalat and other of those who were Samaritans, they come and they want to help in the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah said, no, absolutely not, because they were half Gentile. And so what happens is they started to have trouble. They started to have problems. The Jews could not see the Samaritans because they knew they were partly Jewish, but they were part Gentile as well. As a matter of fact, the Jewish mentality was they were worse than a dog because they said, a dog, at least we know what it is. But a Samaritan, he's half Jew, he have, he's half Gentile. We don't know what he is. He's neither one or the other. And so the reason why I want to mention all of this is because this man that comes back to give thanks to Jesus for what he had done was not Jewish. He was actually despised by the Jews. And so he comes back and, th and thanks Jesus 
for what he did for him. Have you ever met someone who is not a Christian who is more grateful to whatever favor you have done than actual Christians are grateful to you? Sometimes other brothers and sisters, you know, they take it for granted, you know. Well, he's a Christian, and so he should be doing that. Never say thank you. And sometimes those that are not Christians tend to be more thankful people than those who should be the most thankful people in the world, those who have been the recipients of God's mercy, us Christians. And so the point that I want you to see with all of this is gratitude will go a long way. Your spouse, your wife, for example, she serves you dinner. It's not going to make you any less of a man to say thank you. It won't make you any less of a man to do that. Uh, maybe your husband comes back from work in the afternoon, it's hot, and maybe he does some work around the house, some work around the yard, keep the place nice looking. There's nothing wrong with saying thank you. No. Why? Because gratitude is one of those things that absolutely is encouraged by the Scriptures. And Jesus here makes mention, weren't they nine? Weren't the others Jews? No one was willing to say thank you to God except this foreigner. Well, if the foreigner is able to recognize how important thankfulness is, being grateful, well, so also should we. Notice what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 15. Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes and says this, verse number 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of God, of Christ, rule in your hearts, and be thankful. If indeed the gospel has made a difference in your life, be a grateful person. Say thank you. There's nothing wrong. I, like I said, uh, as a man, you know, uh, when I, I go home and my wife serves me dinner or lunch or whatever, you know, I always have the habit of saying thank you. It doesn't make me less of a man to be thankful for the fact that she is doing, you know, something for me. Uh, and so being thankful is absolutely one of those themes over and over in all the scripture. For example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18, Paul says there, in everything give thanks. Now granted within the context is giving thanks to God, but it, it's the same principle to be thankful with those who are around us who do things for us. Be thankful. You want to have a strong relationship at home as a spouse, as a husband, as a wife. Be thankful for the things that your spouse does for you, and you will have a good, uh, a good strong marriage, or you will have a good, strong relationship. Be thankful to the brethren. You know, the, uh, here, uh, well, I, I, I'm sorry to say this. Sometimes I've been running in a little bit right in the nick of time, but someone got here first to open up the building. Someone got here first to make sure the air conditioner or the heater during the winter, whatever, it's on. Have you ever known who it is? Sometimes, you know, it's all done quietly. Nobody is looking for the recognition. But there's nothing wrong with saying thank you to the brother or the person who does that uh, on a regular basis. Someone stays behind to lock up. Someone stays behind to turn off the lights and make sure everything is secure. Say thank you. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't make us any less if we are just thankful to those who do things for the service of others. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. I want you to notice the principle here, because I know it's talking about something different. But look at Matthew 6, verse number 21. It says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Jesus says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. I grant the context is talking about something different. Don't set your heart on the things of this earth, but set them on the things of, of heaven. And so Jesus says there in verse 21, where your heart is, there your, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Now, what is the point? If you look at the principle of that statement and apply it to being grateful, when you express gratitude to someone, your heart is going to show how important or how valuable that person or that relationship is to you. Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And so when it comes to constructive words. I think that not only kind words should be the very foundation of everything that we do, but also demonstrate that by being thankful, by being grateful individuals. And so, obviously, if you implement these, if you practice these, it gets easier and easier and easier the more you do it. And it will only be beneficial to you and those around you. But not only are we to use grateful words, I would say also words that edify, words that build up. Obviously, that's the whole idea behind the lesson. Constructive words, the power of those constructive words. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 29, 
the Apostle Paul talks about this idea of how words can definitely be very encouraging, very edifying. Chapter 4 of Ephesians, and in verse number 29, the Apostle Paul says this, verse number 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed out from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that you will give grace to those who hear. Let no unwholesome word, empty words, words that have no value, words that have no meaning, don't use any unwholesome words, don't let that proceed out of your mouth, but those that are good for edification, those that will build up. And so, again, one of the things that, why it's so important, we oftentimes encourage brothers and sisters to attend, if at all possible, every time that we have to come together and study is because the Word of God has been designed for this purpose to build us up, to encourage us, to show us how we are to uh, act, how we are to uh, behave. Uh, and, and so this is why we oftentimes encourage everyone to come to the studies. If, you know, and I don't want to make a judgment call since I really don't know anyone here, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the reality is when you have a congregation where, you know, a good portion of them don't come to anything but the Sunday morning cl uh, studies or, or the Sunday morning service, don't even come to Bible class, uh, you know, you can see sometimes they're more on the weaker side, spiritually speaking. Again, I don't want to make any judgment calls because I really don't know. There might be some who have legitimate reasons why they cannot come uh, and assemble. But in almost every congregation, it happens where a good portion just, they just think, all I have to do is Sunday morning. That's all it is. Don't even come to the Bible study. That's just Sunday morning. But then you realize, you know, there's so much growth that they have missed because of that lack of knowing what the scriptures teach. And by the way, I'm not saying that own personal studies are not good, uh, but I think that uh, most of the things that I've learned over the years has been by comments that other brethren make uh, about how they understand a certain passage or how to apply it. And, and my understanding just expands just by hearing what others uh, understand about the scriptures. Well, the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, had said this to the elders at the church of Ephesus. He said this in verse 32. And now I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word of God is able to build us up. How can we use edifying words? Learn what the word of God says. Apply what the word of God says, because it's able to build you up. That's the point of the scriptures. Compare this to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And look at what Paul says in verse number 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 11. The Apostle Paul said this, verse number 11 of chapter 5. Paul writes and says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. Now it's interesting because the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Thessalonians, if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, he says to them, you know, you guys are doing great. What you're doing is absolutely great. But he says at the end of verse number one, he says, excel still more. You're doing great, but you can do more. You're doing absolutely commendable, but you can do more. And so when he says in verse 11, encourage one another, they were doing that. But Paul says there, build up one another just as you are also doing. They were doing these things. But Paul says, Excel still more. I come to every service. I come to every gathering. I, I, I do all these things. Great. Excel still more. There's a lot more that we can do. And so the point that I want you to see is, again, uh, it, it's much more than just learning this information, but expressing this information, encouraging one another, edify one another, and you will have a strong, not only relationship at home, not only at work, but also in the church, you will have a good, strong congregation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Oftentimes we quote verse 25, which again, it's a very good verse. It's an important verse. But look at verse 24. The Hebrew writer says there in chapter 10, verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And so like I said, you know, uh, there are many ways that we can do that, but expressing it, just looking for ways that we can encourage one another. Uh, it's certainly one of the best forms to do that, to try to encourage one another to love and to good deeds. And so using words that can edify, 
will only fortify whatever relationship you are in, whether it's a relationship at work, uh, as an employer, as an employee, uh, as a supervisor, or as someone who is uh, just uh, uh, being uh, uh, or working and, and, and being under a supervisor. It doesn't, re it doesn't matter. If you do these things, your relationships will only improve, and especially when it comes to our relationship as Christians in the local church. Romans chapter 14 and in verse number five, uh, uh, 19, not, uh, not 15, Romans 14, verse 19, the Apostle Paul said this, So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. We pursue the things which may per, make for peace and the building up of one another. We need to pursue that. We need to follow that and express that. Use our words to encourage one another. If we do that, you're going to see once again how constructive, how edifying words can definitely be. Similar to the idea of edifying words, I would say it's helpful words. Absolutely. Things that can help someone, things that can uh, assist someone in, in, in a moment of distress, that can definitely make the day of someone. Now, I try not to let things bother me too much, but sometimes it happens where, you know, something happens and you kind of get a little discouraged. But I still try to act like nothing is wrong. And sometimes there's brethren that way that try to, you know, just on their own, just try to uh, process whatever happened. And so sometimes we don't know if people are having a bad day. And that's why being able to use our words to help, to encourage someone can make a huge difference because oftentimes we don't know if someone is having a bad day. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, again, I understand some of these passages have to do with something totally different. And in this context, it's talking about the spiritual gifts, but we know also that the Apostle Paul mentions that not all spiritual gifts were miraculous. Some were not miraculous. And some of us have gifts like that, gifts of encouragement and so on. But look at what Paul says in verse number 7. Each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Whatever ability you have, whatever ability that you have been able to either develop or it's something that is just natural to you, whatever that is, use it for the common good. Use it to help one another. Again, the context here is talking about miraculous gifts. I understand that. But the principle here, very clear. The Spirit has given each and every one of us different abilities. Whatever it is that you have, use it for the common good. Proverbs 10, verse 31. Again, the New American Standard words are a little bit different, but let's go ahead and read it. Proverbs 10, and in verse 31, and then I'm going to show you how it's worded in the New Living Translation. I understand the New Living Translation is a paraphrase, but I think it does a very interesting uh, way, or, or does a, a very interesting job there in translating that passage. Verse 31, it says this, The mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom, but the perverted tongue will be cut off. Now notice the first part of that verse. The mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom. The New Living Translation says, the mouth of the godly person gives wise advice. The mouth of the godly gives wise advice. And so how, do we, how can we use our, our, our words to help others? Well, if we know they're having a bad day, try to find a way that you can help them. What can I do? What can I say that will help an individual who's just having a bad day? Or just listen to someone. Uh, one of my biggest problems has always been when, for example, someone, uh, a member of the church there, uh, they lose a family member, they pass away, whether it's a spouse or a parent or a child. And I've always found it difficult because I freeze like a deer in the headlights. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say because I've never lost a parent, never lost a child, never lost a spouse. So I have no idea what it feels like and I have no idea what to do. And some years ago, a good friend of ours, uh, uh, very, very wise uh, lady, a good uh, uh, Christian. Uh, and uh, she mentioned to me, says, well, the reality is when something like that happens, you don't have to say anything. All you have to do is just make sure that they know you're there for them. You don't have to say a thing. And that's my fear. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And, uh, and she said, you don't have to say anything. Just make sure that they know you are there for them. Because sometimes people, all they need is to make sure they know there's a shoulder there that they can lean their head on and cry. That's all they have to do. And so look for ways that you can help others. If you don't know what to say, like I don't know what to say sometimes, just don't say anything, but just make sure that you're there 
to know that they, they know that they can count on you, that, they're, that you're there to help. Um, it's easy for me to rejoice with those who rejoice. The Apostle Paul talked about it in Romans, the 12th chapter. Uh, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. I've always found difficult that last part of that verse. Uh, when a brother or sister, for example, uh, uh, we've had several in our congregation that over the last couple of years have had uh, children. Oh, yeah, that's great. We love rejoicing with them, you know, new baby and everything. I love that. It's, it's great. I can rejoice with those who rejoice. But I've always found it very difficult to mourn with those who mourn. Uh, and like I said, until this sister told me, she says, all you have to do is just be there. You don't have to say a thing. So helpful words sometimes don't even need words. They just need for you to be there for someone who is going through a difficult time. Chapter 15 of the book of Proverbs, and in verse 28, Proverbs 15, and in verse number 28, once again, the wisdom writer says this, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Look at the first part of that verse. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Sometimes you don't have to give an answer in that moment. Sometimes it's things that we don't know. What do, what do we do? Uh, you know, maybe something we never thought about before. How can we help someone if I don't know what to do? Well, the heart of the righteous thinks about it carefully, ponders how to answer. And so uh, there's nothing wrong, like I said, if you don't know what to do in certain situations. You know, don't know what to say. Sometimes helpful words don't even need words themselves. All they need is for them to know you are there for them. Chapter 25, same book of Proverbs, and in verse 25. Chapter 25, verse 25. The wisdom writer says this, Like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. Like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news. Good words that come to someone from a distant land. Now, for the last couple of days, it's been hot. Uh, good thing it's not humid. I've been in places that it's hot and humid, and it is just unbearable. So when I was looking at the temperatures, and it was saying, you know, uh, it was scheduled to be in the hundreds, I was like, oh boy, this is going to be hot. hot. Uh, but no, I actually felt really comfortable. Uh, by the way, this morning I did feel I could feel my face like I had a sunburn, but uh, you know, it's been, it's been hotter than what I'm used to. But I was thinking unbearably, it's going to be unbearable, unbearably hot. And it wasn't that way. But imagine for a moment, you're out there on a day like we have the last couple of days where it's in the 90s and the 100s. Uh, you're out in the yard working, and then uh, you know, someone comes to you with a cold glass of water, and oh boy, doesn't that feel great to have something to refresh you? The wisdom writer says there, it's like cold water to a weary soul when he hears good news that comes from a distant land. And so, again, the same principle is there when it comes to a person who's having a hard day, who's having a difficult time, and then someone just comes and knows what to say, just there to help, whatever they can do. And in some cases, don't even say anything, just to demonstrate that they are there for them, like a cold cup of water on a hot day. That's how these kinds of words can be, very refreshing, very helpful. And so not only kind words, not only grateful words and edifying words and helpful words, but also sometimes it's very important to use positive words. Now, Brendan uh, will tell you about uh, one of the elders that we had when we lived in Oregon, uh, and uh, he and his wife now, Tom and Susie. Now, Susie, uh, the wife of, uh, of this brother, uh, she has always been the kind of that proverbial ca uh, cup is half full kind of kind of uh, uh, personality, her attitude. Uh, she never saw anything bad in anything. You know, even in the worst of cases, she always looked for the good in it. And that is so refreshing and so encouraging uh, and people love to be around her because of that, you know, because she was always so, she's always so positive. Uh, when we use positive words, everybody enjoys someone who is that way. Nobody likes to be someone who's always a downer, who's always negative, who's always looking for that proverbial fly in the soup. But always a person who's always positive, people flock to that. They enjoy being around people that way. In Luke, the sixth chapter, and in verses 27 or verse 28, look at what Jesus says here. Luke chapter 6 Verses 27 to verse 28, I grant, again, the context is very different, but I want you to notice what it says in verses 27 to verse number 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless and do not curse. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, what's the point? It's hard to be positive when somebody is really mean to you. It's hard to be positive and maintain a good attitude 
when someone is just being really uh, uh, mean to you. And sometimes we want to react by answering in the same fashion, you know. I've always thought that it's better to win uh, or to lose a battle and not lose a war. Sometimes, especially, for example, at home. Uh, although we try to get as much as we can along without any problem, in any marriage, there's going to be times in which, you know, there's a disagreement. And so what do I do? You know, should I get the Mexican out of me and, you know, be the macho and, you know, I'm going to do what I say? Or should I just lose a battle instead of losing my marriage? What do I do? Jesus says there in verse number 28, bless those who curse you. Oh, but you don't know what that person said to me. What they said really was mean. Well, I understand. Sometimes people can be mean. I understand that. But Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hate you. And so be positive. Even under the worst of circumstances, look for what good can I do in order to help this person. Like I said, sometimes a person who's being mean to you, they might be having a bad day. And so what do we need to do? Uh, let me give you an example. You know, I, I, some years ago, I was doing a gospel meeting in L.A., and uh, I, I normally tell brethren, you don't have to walk me into the airport. I'll just, you know, drop me off at the curb and I'll take care of it. Uh, and this was in January. And so uh, California, Southern California, in January, great weather. But the plane that was uh, going to be uh, coming and taking me back to Portland, uh, that was coming from Salt Lake City. It's January, Salt Lake City in Utah, snow, bad snow. So that plane was delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And finally, after several hours, it actually got canceled, and so uh, our flight got canceled. So they told us, you have to go to customer service and see if they can get you on another flight. Well, everybody was upset over several hours of being there and the flight delay. And so when uh, I finally got to the, uh, close to, to the counter, uh, I saw that the two previous persons were mad at the poor customer service guy. It wasn't his fault. He wasn't driving the plane. And so, uh, you know, he's trying to do his best. So when I get, it's my turn, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? The guy's been chewed out by everyone. And so I come to him and says, hey, I know you're probably having a bad day. You know what's going on. And just the way that I was able to talk to him, he says, let me see what I can see, uh, what I can find. And he tells me, he says, well, I can get you to Portland tonight. He says, but you're going to have to change planes in San Francisco. He says, there's only one problem. I'm going to send you on first class. And I said, that's a great problem, no problem. He sends me on first class all the way from L.A. to Portland because of the way I talked to him. Everybody else, he said, no, there's no flights until tomorrow, no flights until tomorrow, no flights until tomorrow. But he got me on that flight and on, in first class. And so it's, uh, you know, it was a pretty uh, uh, neat of him that having done that. But I know why. It was the way he was talked to. It had to be because there was no difference between me and all the other passengers that lost their flight. It was the way they were talking to him. I understand. They were frustrated because we had been there for hours and finally the flight got canceled. But the point that I want you to see is, yes, it's true. You end up catching more flies with honey than with vinegar. Now, if we are willing to use positive words, even the person that's having the worst of days will be able to respond in the same fashion. They will do that. Paul, in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 14, the apostle Paul said this in verse 14, bless those who persecute you Bless and do not curse. Oh, but you don't know how he talked to me or how she talked to me. I grant sometimes people can be upset and say some pretty mean things. But if we respond in the same way, what's only going to happen is it's going to make the problem worse. Uh, if you are having a bonfire, for example, at home and, uh, you know, it's getting late, you're not going to put more wood in there if you're, you know, getting ready to go home, go inside the house. What do you do? You stop putting wood in it and the fire will go out. If you use that same analogy in a situation where somebody said something bad to you, something that is hurtful, well, guess what? If you answer in the same way, it's only going to cause the problem to become worse. If you are willing to speak positively and maybe even try to be kind in your words, you will see that the argument or whatever disagreement, it will cool down. Look at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. I grant that this passage has been quoted and misquoted by so many people in this country. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the context is very clear what he's talking about. Well, I want you to notice the principle here. Uh, Jeremiah 29, and in verse 11, the prophet, again, he's talking to those who are in, in captivity. And uh, most of the people of Judah, they're thinking we are done as a nation. We're never coming back. And not only uh, Jeremiah, but Ezekiel also actually talks quite a bit 
giving the people hope that, yes, the Lord will bring them back into their land. And I want you to notice what Jeremiah says in verse 11 of chapter 29. This is what he said to the people. Uh, and he's speaking on behalf of God, and he says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give a future and a hope. Now I want you to notice that last part. God said to the people of Israel that he had a plan for them to give them a future and hope. If you're in a situation where somebody is mean to you, they're saying things that are hurtful, look for a way to hopefully fix that. Have a plan for a good future and hope. And how do we do that? By expressing ourselves with positive words, with kind words, uh, with words that will be uh, helpful in the situation rather than make the situation worse. Words can be very destructive. We talked about that yesterday. But words can also be very healing if we're willing to use uh, the kind of expression that will help, positive words, you will see also the effect of that. And so uh, I would not only suggest to, you know, make it a habit of speaking kind words, grateful words, edifying words, helpful words, positive words, but I think that another one too that is very important, closely related, is apologetic words also. Sometimes saying thank you makes a huge difference, and sometimes saying I'm sorry makes even a better difference. Proverbs 15, and in verse number one, like I said a moment ago, if you stop putting fire or, or wood into the fire, it will ultimately go out. Well, look at what the wisdom writer says in verse number one. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Answer in the same fashion, and guess what? It's going to make a problem, a small problem, a bigger problem. But a gentle answer, he says there, turns away wrath. Oh, but you don't understand. That person said something, and you know, I didn't deserve it. I, I, it may be true. I don't know. Maybe that was uh, the case in which you did something right, and you still got chewed out for it. But guess what? It doesn't kill us to admit maybe I was wrong. I'm sorry. It won't kill us, but it will definitely help a lot in any disagreement. And so, and like I said, especially for those of us who've been, who are married, uh, probably, you know, you know that sometimes we'll, even in the best of marriages, we'll have disagreements. Try just saying, I'm sorry. Try just uh, at times just saying, okay, I, uh, I, I did something wrong. I'm sorry. And you will see how much it can help in those arguments and those disagreements. First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. The apostle Peter says there, Jesus, although he was being mistreated for nothing that he'd done wrong, the apostle Peter goes on and explains, you know, he's our example there at the end of chapter 2. And as he continues on his argument, he says in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 3, he says this, to sum up everything that he had been arguing there, what Jesus had done in the example that he left, uh, Peter says there, to sum it all up, all of you, be uh, he says there, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Not returning evil for evil. After all this argument that he makes, Jesus was mistreated for no reason. He didn't do anything to deserve it. But he left you an example, he says in verse 21 of chapter 2. He left you an example to follow on his steps. And so as he's wrapping up this argument, he says to sum it all up. As a, as, as a conclusion to all this, he says there in verse number 9, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Jesus had said in the book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, that a house divided, any kingdom, and a house divided against itself will not stand, will not survive. Any kingdom, any home, anywhere, whether it is a home of members of the church or a home of unbelievers. You know, we have a proverb down in Mexico that says that that old bucket can only go so many times down the well before it breaks. If you are consistently having issues because you just will never say sorry, you will never find ways of using kind words in, in a disagreement. That is going to go only so far before that finally breaks. And finally, uh, you know, you see your house destroyed, your, your, your business destroyed, the church destroyed. Kind words, uh, grateful words, edifying words, positive words, helpful words, apologetic words can definitely make a huge impact in building up and strengthening any relationship. Really quickly here, and then we are done. The book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 or verse 15. The Hebrew writer said this, Pursue peace with all men 
and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it be defiled. Pursue peace with all men. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. And so I think that if we make a habit of developing these types of words in our speech, in our daily interactions with everyone, you will see every relationship, whether it is at work, at home, or the church, any relationship that you may have, you're going to see that just become stronger and become more stable, and ultimately God will be glorified. The habit of saying these kinds of words, it can develop very quickly. And when this formed, it's going to be very hard to get rid of it. It's going to be very hard to lose that. And so my encouragement to you, like I said yesterday, instead of using our tongue for the purpose of destruction, look for ways that you can use your, uh, your, your words for the purpose of edification, for the purpose of building up. And once that habit is there, it's going to be very, very difficult to lose that. And so I really appreciate so much your uh, kindness over the last several days uh, and the opportunity to be here with you and to uh, have these Bible studies. I hope and pray that in one way or another, uh, my simple way of, of preaching the gospel has been encouraging to you, that it's been helpful in one way or another. Uh, but again, I really uh, appreciate so much, especially your confidence in the recommendation of, of uh, Brendan uh, to have me here. I'm just a country preacher. I'm just a hillbilly preacher. And so, uh, you know, not a lot of people know me, but I really appreciate, uh, once again, the fact that uh, Brendan uh, recommended me and you guys were uh, confident in his recommendation. So I hope in one way or another, our time together over the last few days has been very encouraging and helpful. Uh, and as always, we don't want to dismiss this uh, time together uh, without briefly describing what is it that a person must do in order to be saved. There might be here some who are not Christians yet. And if that is your case, you are here, but you are not a Christian. And you're wondering, what is it that I need to do in order to be right with God? And, and, and the question is an important question. The most important question a person could ever have. What is it that I need to do in order to be saved? If you have that question this evening, you desire to be in fellowship with God. The Bible tells us in very clear words, what is it that we need to do in order to become a Christian? If you have heard the gospel message and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you're willing to repent of your sins and confess that very truth, that you believe that He is the Savior, the one who came to this world, died for us, and that He is now uh, in heaven on the right hand of God, interceding for us. If you're willing to make the confession that you believe that truth, you need to be baptized in order to receive the benefits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is useless if no one obeys it. But if you're willing to submit to His will, the Bible tells us that the benefits of His shed blood will be given to you. You will be forgiven of your sins. You will be saved. If you haven't done that, we have water ready this evening. We'd be more than happy to assist you in your obedience to the gospel. If you've already done that in the past, you are a Christian, but you realize that you haven't been living your life the way that you should as a Christian. Maybe there's sin in your life that has brought shame or reproach upon the Lord, and you want to correct that this evening. We can pray with you, our dear brother or sister. We can pray for you, but we can only do these things if we know your needs. So if you have any need tonight, whether it be united with Christ in baptism or be restored into the faithful, seeking the prayers of the congregation, won't you let us know? We invite you to come forward as together we stand and sing the song of invitation.